Hi everyone, um, we're ready for our next lecture on um, marine biology. Um, today we're going to be talking about adaptations of marine organisms, so like things that are special about them that allow them to live in the marine environment, whereas if we were living in that environment, we wouldn't be able to because we don't have these adaptations. And so we talked a bit ago about how the marine environment is more stable than the land, meaning there's not as much difference between marine environments. So the example we used was if you're in a desert marine environment, whether you're in the Pacific Ocean or the Atlantic Ocean or the Indian Ocean, that desert environment is all the same in all those places. And so therefore, we talked about there being less speciation in the ocean, and that's because of this stability that the marine environment provides. Well, the other flip side of that is that organisms in the marine environment are less able um, to withstand environmental changes. So they're very specifically uh, adapted to live in those spaces. And so if those spaces change, they're not able to change with it. Um, one of these is called protoplasm. And protoplasm is what kind of makes up the substance of living matter. And we, in humanity and in creatures like this, primarily that protoplasm is made up of water. And so you can look at the different creatures down here. Humans are 65 to 70% water. Um, and marine creatures are almost exclusively more than that, depending on what they are. Um, so they don't risk what's called desiccation. They don't risk drying out because they need that water. This is why fish have to live in water. Otherwise, they dry out because their protoplasm, their matter is made up highly of that water. We also talk about how their physical support is adapted to live in the marine environment. Some creatures are buoyant. Um, well, all creatures are buoyant to some degree. Some sink and float easily, more easily than others. But this buoyancy allows them to um, swim through the water instead of just sinking down or floating up. Um, so we call this neutral buoyancy, meaning at some level and some depth in the water, they kind of reach an equilibrium and they're able to swim up and down with their propulsion from there. And so that buoyancy helps them just to resist sinking like a rock. So you have different structures in cold water versus warm water um, that allow for that buoyancy. And that's because water changes in its viscosity or its thickness um, with temperature. You also have smaller sizes that are different, that represent different um, physical support structures as well. So the difference down here, these are two creatures that are in the same genus, but they're two different species because one of them is a warm water species and one of them is a cold water species. So you can see that the cold water species have fewer appendages. So this would be your cold water species and the warm water species have more appendages. This would be your warm water species. Cold water is thicker, and so you don't need as much to help you be buoyant because the water itself is providing resistance. But warm water is very thin, and so not thick and not viscous, and so you need those extra appendages to kind of help spread things out and stay buoyant in the water. We have a surface area to volume ratio as another way that creatures stay buoyant. Um, phytoplankton benefit from being small and that helps them float through the water because remember plankton means floater and so their smallness that's why plankton are small um, typically because they are floating through water and that helps them be um, resistant to sinking so if you just kind of look at different surface area your crab is going to have to have a much larger surface area in order to still be able to float. Whereas your smaller plankton are going to be able to be smaller. And so we can do that. Uh, this is one type of diatom, or no, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, diatom. No, I apologize, radiolarian. Um, 
that has these unusual appendages and this is all just able to help it like fan out and be buoyant. So all of these different ways of um, spreading things out and kind of taking up more space in the water help you to um, be more buoyant. Streamlining is another adaptation. And if you think about a fish, how it looks streamlined, it has kind of a flatter body and then a tapered back end. Um, this helps avoid resistance in through as it's swimming through the water. So if we think about our different creatures here, we've got a penguin, a turtle, a walrus, and a fish. They all have this kind of chunkier front end and then this narrow back end, and that helps them to um, flow easily and efficiently through the water as they're swimming. So streamlining is a huge deal in the water, and this is why a lot of creatures have this streamlined body shape. Um, it's because it helps them be most efficient as they're swimming through the water and putting out as little energy as possible to get where they need to go. As far as reproduction, one of the adaptations that many creatures have taken on is called broadcast spawning. This is where the eggs and the sperm are directly released into the seawater. They're not, um, eggs are not laid in a particular spot. And marine organisms take advantage of this because of that high viscosity. Those eggs will float um, and the sperm will be able to directly interact with the eggs in the water. And this actually enhances reproduction chances for many species. So many species are broadcast spawners. So make sure that you take note of that in your creature if that applies to yours. Now, temperature and salinity are two of the most important characteristics of the ocean water. Um, and they directly relate to what types of creatures we see in that water as well. So in temperature, we have a pretty narrow range of temperatures in the ocean. Yes, we have warm oceans and colder oceans, but the temperature range that we experience in the water is much, much less than we experience on land. And so because we have those smaller variations, the ocean is considered what's called isothermal. Iso means same, thermal means heat. So relatively speaking, it's pretty much the same across the board. Now, when it comes to creatures, you need to look at your different marine environments, and this kind of shows that comparison. If you look on land, we have areas on land that experience um, lows of negative 88 degrees Celsius and highs of 58 degrees Celsius. So the range, the lowest to the highest is 146 degrees on average. If you look at the coastal areas, we do experience a larger range on coastal areas just because your um, heat exchange is easier in the coastal area, but still it's going from 146 degrees on land down to just a 42 degree range. That's a pretty significant difference. And then out in the open ocean, we only experience a range of 34 degrees. And that seems like a lot to us because we're sensitive to those changes, but it's really not a lot to marine creatures. And so because of the ocean being more stable on land, they are more stable in terms of what they can tolerate. Now, for these reasons, um, these reasons are why that ocean is able to maintain that lower range of temperatures. So water holds heat very, very well. And so it doesn't take it in very easily and it doesn't let go of it very easily once it has it. Um, so you can um, reduce ocean warming also by evaporation. So all we need to do to reduce the temperature, or keep the temperatures the same is evaporate, allow some water to evaporate and that helps the temperature stay stable. We also have solar radiation that penetrates deeply into ocean layers and then the ocean mixes that. The ocean's constantly in motion, we've already talked about that. So mixing is a huge deal in terms of keeping those temperatures stable. We have, again, talking about the appendages, um, your floating organisms are smaller in uh, warmer seawater. This is kind of our cold versus warm comparison. Tropical organisms grow faster, but they live a shorter life, and so therefore they reproduce more often. 
um, you have more species in warmer seawater and your more biomass, like the more amount of stuff in cooler seawater. That's why upwelling is such a big deal. We have two types of creatures and you'll need to tell me which yours is. It's stenothermal and urethermal. You have organisms that withstand a small variation. The S's go together, steno, small. And urethermal is organisms that can withstand a large variation. So they typically will live in coastal waters and your stenothermal will typically live in your open ocean. We also have those same categories based on salinity tolerance. And so organisms that can only withstand a small variation in salinity are stenohaline, and organisms that can withstand a large variation in salinity are urihaline. Now with our salinity adaptations, we look at two different things. We looked at um, diffusion, which is the um, processing of nutrients, like the stuff is actually going across the cell membrane. And we look at osmosis, which is the water going across the membrane. And so what you need to know about diffusion and um, osmosis is diffusion again is the stuff, is the nutrients and the oxygen and the waste. All of those molecules, those can pass through the cell membrane. Whereas osmosis, it's the water that goes back and forth, the stuff does not. And all of this is allowed, is what allows things to balance out. So if you need more nutrients, you take in more nutrients. If you need less nutrients, you bring in more water. So different creatures um, do different things with osmosis and diffusion. And really that um, boils down to freshwater fish being hypertonic relative to their environment. And so they experience that high osmotic pressure. And so most of us are not doing freshwater because I told you not to. Um, so what we're really looking at is at saltwater processes. So saltwater fish do actually drink in the water and they secrete salt back out their gills. And then they only have a small concentrated amount of urine that they produce. And they take water out of their system by osmosis. So the big thing difference between freshwater and saltwater is freshwater fish use diffusion because they lose their salt through their skin and saltwater fish use osmosis to balance that out as well. We also have gills in all of our fish and they exchange oxygen and carbon dioxide directly with the seawater. And those gills are able to extract dissolved oxygen directly from the seawater. This is why they don't need to surface to breathe and this is why dead zones are a huge issue for them because that dissolved oxygen is being absorbed by um, everything else. And um, they are not able to take it in, even though there's plenty of water to take in. Here are the gills as an up close look and detailed look. So if you're doing a fish, you're gonna wanna include some information on their gill system. And then we have water's transparency. Obviously water is clear and we have some creatures that need to be clear and that helps them elude predators and also to stalk their prey. We have camouflage and counter shading. These are again things that help them eat and not be eaten. Camouflage is color patterns that match their surroundings and counter shading is dark on top and light on bottom. So again, you're gonna need to include any that your creatures might have. Disruptive coloration is similar to camouflage, but really it's just like a distraction more than a blending in. And so some creatures use that as well. Here would be an example of camouflage where you have the walleye fish, or excuse me, the rock fish. You can see the walleye right there um, blending in with its surrounding. And here you have counter shading. This is the top side of a halibut, looks dark, and the bottom side looks light. Now the deep scattering layer where light begins to um, uh, diffuse into the ocean and you know, you're transitioning between your lighter areas and your darker areas is really important because this is where fish go to not be seen. Um, and so we have these creatures that all go to this area and it actually can send false, they can go in such great concentration that they can send false readings um, through sonar. This daily movement, this daily migration, um, them going up and down, 
uh, based on protection and feeding uh, is super important. So if that applies to your creature, make sure that they um, you include that. We also have pressure and fish contains 